Welcome to Face the State. I'm Ariana Bennett. Thank you for joining us. Well, at the end of last year, the city of Reno approved a new master plan. It's basically the document that shapes the city as it grows from land use and zoning to infrastructure, green space, emergency services, transportation, you name it. Now, a close look at this plan gives us a good clue about what to expect in the biggest little city over the next 20 years. So, Reno City Council member Jenny Breckis and senior planner Sienna Reed are both here to talk about that. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Now this uh, this update to the master plan, obviously it's a big undertaking. This is a 300 page document. How often is it supposed to be updated? Well, it's actually not an update. It is a whole new master plan. The last one was adopted in 1997, which is really too long. It, it should be about a 20 year document. Um, and so we let that run a little bit longer than we probably should have, um, but um, that's that's how long it's supposed to last. Boy, I mean, 1997. So, I mean, if you think about Reno in 97 compared to Reno now, it would be almost, I mean, it is almost unrecognizable. So I imagine, I mean, was it like starting from scratch or did you base this new master plan off of what you had previously? The old master plan was just riddled with uh, bullet holes and was just not helpful in any way. We'd gone through a boom, a bust, and then another boom on it. So we really did not have the policy roadmap to take us into the future. And that's what this new master plan will do for us. Yeah, and just to build off of that, it was definitely a full comprehensive look at the policies that guide decision making, decision -making in the city. And so we really did step back and say, what is good in the master plan that we have? What can we carry forward? But then what do we need to add in? And as part of that adding in process, we did extensive community outreach. That was something that was really paramount from the beginning of the project is saying, what does the city of Reno want to see? What do the residents value and what is their vision and how can the city help to accomplish that over time through its policies and decisions. Were there any major overarching themes that people agreed on that they wanted to see that you found through this outreach? Yeah, absolutely. So um, through our extensive visioning and values work where we reached um, actually over 6,000 people, what really rose to the top there was uh, a base for outdoor recreation activities that really ranked the highest. Um, and then an arts and culture center, and then really tied for third, a university town and a technology center. Um, a lot of things uh, that people agreed on in the community were also safety, um, really wanting to invest in our existing infrastructure, not let any of that degrade. Um, downtown revitalization was very much key, and then being able to walk throughout our community, really having that opportunity to walk to a variety of places uh, in a safe way. So those were all things that the community very much um, was aligned on. Okay, I imagine with all of those goals in mind, um, managing this kind of unprecedented growth that we're seeing in the city uh, is, is the challenge, right? Because with all the people coming in here, it's gonna stretch our resources until we, we grow to meet the challenge. So how much of this new plan um, accounts for all the new people? Well, uh, the document is to be used by the Planning Commission, the City Council, uh, when faced with development proposals. Is this proposal consistent with where we've outlined we want to go? So it'll be tested and challenged over those sort of periods. As we go into budget, whether it's at the city or through RTC or TAMWA, who provide the transportation and the water for our community, uh, it'll also guide those investment decisions. So it really has worked in, the, worked in those two ways. and. Um, and it, it should be a good template for us to follow through on. There's a lot of to-do lists also, tasks to do to keep it implementing, to keep implementing it and other things that we need to do. But um, plans are really only as good as you uh, implement them and monitor them and update the data. That is the premise for a lot of um, you know the, the policies and goals. But the first part that Sienna spoke about, the community values, uh, clarification that really is you know the 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 broad and then everything else is how to protect and maintain and establish that so is the document then fairly changeable or is it pretty set in stone so the document is meant to be revisited on a regular basis um, we do kind of bigger looks in terms of five-year updates do we need to really get in there and um, revise policies in a more significant way. But another thing that we've built into this new master plan 
is being able to monitor the plan and our performance in different policy areas over time. So that's something that will occur on an annual basis, so we'll really be able to get a much better sense of where we are um, within the community and how we are or are not achieving our policy objectives. So this, this plan is meant to be a bit more nimble. Um, we do want it to be um, updated on a regular basis in terms of um, our implementation actions, which is actually a new component of this master plan. Um, so we're hoping that it'll serve the community well in terms of you know, what the community wanted to see uh, with its vision, the guiding principles of the plan, all the way down to those very detailed actions that the city's going to be taking uh, to advance that vision. Okay, so I think probably the number one issue that most people who live in Reno are going to want to know about is how is our affordable housing shortage and our general housing situation addressed within this master plan. So um, I know that the city has some power to um, adjust zoning and land use um, and some subsidizing power. Um, is that about where your influence ends or is there more you can do to help out the housing market? Well, two of the policies that are really important to me are one, that we monitor the land supply. So we have an understanding of what land we have available for new growth, for what sort of housing product. And we also have a very good understanding of what sort of housing product we will be needing in the future based upon the demographics, the socioeconomic data that we've analyzed. And for example, some of these larger lot, Foothill, more suburban, it's a more costly product to build. It's more because it has a lot more infrastructure lines out to it. It's out in the far reaches where our fire and police coverage is scarce. We have an oversupply of that sort of land but we are short in some of the more denser urban land, uh, smaller products. Uh, and so that, that will help us to know how much land we have available for each over, over the time, and that'll help the city make their commitments of when they're ready to approve an entitlement in one place or another, or we need to invest over here because we have the infrastructure, we need to get the infrastructure over here to allow this housing product to come up on here you know at this at this point in time so that's how it's going to help us with meeting the housing demands and the important thing to know about housing is um, city doesn't build it with um, very few exceptions are we involved in it and really our involvement in it is is maybe 50 60 units a year um, on subsidized affordable housing that we get uh, money from the federal government and then we have the Reno Housing Authority that also provides subsidy um, product. So it's really the market that, that does that and we need to be in partnership with the development community bringing on the right product that um, our, our uh, you know, population can afford now and in the future. And one important data point that we've discovered that I don't think a lot of people knew is about almost half of Reno residents are renters. And that's a, that's a different complexion than I think a lot of us have been thinking about what the Reno population is and that will be a trend that will be continuing on in the future and so um, you know that's some of the issues that the council has to keep in mind as we you know make land use decisions. Yeah and and I mean speaking of land use I think a pretty good example of this is the ongoing debate over whether the Stonegate development should be built that's this you know huge planned community in the Cold Springs area 5,000 homes three schools uh, you know some commercial retail space it's a big, big proposal, and the council seems to be going back and forth on it a little bit. Um, but you do have some control over developments being built when it has to do with zoning and land use, right? Yeah, and the timing, certainly the timing. Because land, particularly land out in the sagebrush, is only valuable if the public is ready to invest fire, police services out there, and even the infrastructure lines that go out there. That, that request is still pending. You know, my mind isn't made up in any way about where we're going on that. The Planning Commission, our staff has recommended approval. But my question is, is that bringing a product that we already have a surplus? of land already ahead in the queue to bring on. That's one of the questions. Another question, um, one of the to-do actions is to look in the four quadrants of the city and see where we're, what land we're best avail, able to serve at what point in time. Because if we're leapfrogging over, then we're not making good land use decisions. And one of the big concerns that's come up a lot is the infrastructure leading to that project. So, you know, we've already got road congestion in that area, and you'd have to probably build the underground infrastructure that already exists in the main part of the city. So at what point does the need for housing 
justify building that level of infrastructure, or, or does it ever? You want to talk about infill? Yeah, so um, just in the context of the new master plan, um, housing is really addressed kind of in a kind of longer range approach. So it's what type of housing um, do we need to meet the citizens demand as council uh, member breakfast alluded to. It's a much more diverse housing product um, than we've needed in the past. And so as we look towards land use decisions, um, whether those are in areas that are, are more central city areas or whether those are areas that are further removed, um, we really need to look at the overall um, type of housing that we have and that we need. We definitely need an increase in units to meet our population demand over time. Um, but is, uh, if you have a, a new housing development coming online, how does it help to meet the city's goals in terms of housing diversity? We do have a specific policy that is really looking uh, for us to approve projects that have a wider range of housing options within them. So we've um, over the past built a lot of detached single family homes on relatively large lots. Um, so we need to, as we look forward to these new projects, say, well, what type of other options do they have? Do they have apartments, maybe duplexes, triplexes, and townhomes? Um, so that's going to be really key um, in our new projects and then certainly um, having an understanding of the infrastructure impacts. Can we extend infrastructure? Can we extend public safety services? Those are really key things. And uh, traditionally, our infill areas, kind of central city areas, already have a lot of that infrastructure and services in place. So if these new developments were to come to you and say, we're going to build multifamily high-density housing at an affordable level, would that justify expanding out the infrastructure you know, where it's needed? Not necessarily, because some we're getting to such far out land that, like you mentioned, is posing a lot of congestion because this land where maybe residential isn't where the jobs are and where people are going for most of the day. So, um, you know, transit is going to end up starting to be part of the conversation in this community, and we really have not gotten there. We're still doing cutbacks. The RTC is planning on more cutbacks in the fall for um, transit service. And so we may be getting to the point where we just have got to make a tilt over in how we're making those transportation investments. Um, congestion usually follows job growth by about two or three percent. And we've ramped up very quickly in the last three or four years. So you're seeing that congestion, you know, the big clog spot is the spaghetti bowl. And then of course the new trend of heading east out to the tri-center. And so you know, we're just at a point where we may we need to start to make land use decisions that are not going to exacerbate um, congestion on the roads, or um, you know, also make a decision: how much are we going to spend on the freeway system, and can you build yourself out of it? You can't build yourself out of congestion. You know, you can keep building bigger roads, and it induces more transit, more more traffic. So um, you got to get a balance of making decisions that, you know, if, if you can do the infill, can invest in transit, maybe you'll have less, you know, clogged roads. Okay, well, I want to talk more about transit. I think it's a perfect chance for us to take a quick break. But coming up on Face the State, we will be back to talk about more changes to Reno's master plan. Stay with us.